This presentation will focus on the hazards to aviation posed by thunderstorms. It will also provide an overview of how thunderstorms develop and will discuss the types of thunderstorms. The reason that thunderstorms are so impactful to aviation is because of the hazards associated with them. Wind shear, turbulence, icing all tend to be moderate or severe in thunderstorms. Lightning and hail are also major hazards in and near thunderstorms. Within a thunderstorm, there are strong upward and downward currents of air, both of which create a significant amount of turbulence within the storm. Near the surface, the thunderstorm outflow can produce severe wind shear within a couple thousand feet from the surface. Near the top portions of the thunderstorms, which can be up to 50, 60, or 70,000 feet, there is clear air turbulence. Clear air turbulence can affect locations several miles away from the actual thunderstorm. The strong upward transport of supercooled droplets in a thunderstorm poses significantly increased risk of icing. Note that the thunderstorm outflow, which is marked by a gust front, which marks the lead edge of the strong winds emanating out of the thunderstorm, can extend several miles out from the parent thunderstorm. In this image, the gust front is extending 10 miles out from the parent thunderstorm. The pilot who is landing at the airport thinks he or she is beating the storm. However, note that with the lead edge of the gust front, which may not even be visible by the pilot, that lead edge is already moving across the airport runway. So the pilot is going to encounter severe wind shear as he or she lands. The three main ingredients needed in the production of thunderstorms are moisture, instability, and a source of lift. Moisture is represented on a surface map by the dew point. High moisture values are typical with dew points in the 60s and 70s. Instability is a measure of the ability of air parcels to rise. Rising currents of air are needed for thunderstorm production. As the air rises, the moisture within the air cools, condensing into cloud droplets. Continued upward motion leads to additional cooling and condensation until rain droplets develop in the top of the cloud. Meteorologists often look at the lifted index to assess an instability. Lifted index values that are negative indicate an unstable atmosphere. CAPE, which stands for Convective Available Potential Energy, is another parameter meteorologists use to assess instability. The higher the CAPE values, the more unstable the environment. To initiate lift within a moist and unstable environment, you also need a source of lift. This is a weather system that forces air parcels upward into the air. If the parcels are unstable, they will continue to rise and thus generate clouds and, if the environment is unstable enough, thunderstorms. Cold and warm fronts, Outflow from other thunderstorms and lake breeze boundaries, which act as small cold fronts, all can generate lift. Now, assuming all of these ingredients are in place, we will go through the three stages of thunderstorm development. The first stage is known as the towering cumulus stage. During this stage, warm and unstable air begins to rise. As the air rises, it cools and the moisture condenses into liquid cloud droplets. Persistent rising currents of air, known as updrafts, cause the clouds to grow in height, looking like tall towers. In this initial stage of development, the clouds are dominated by rising currents of air or updrafts. Noticing these towering cumulus are important to aviation because they alert to imminent thunderstorm development. Note the well-defined, crisp cloud top edges. This cloud in this picture will continue to develop and may lead to a thunderstorm. Again, in this picture, note the crisp, well-defined cloud tops and the vertical extent of these clouds. And again, note the tall cloud with the crisp cloud edges. If you watch closely, you can actually see these clouds slowly getting taller with time. 
These are not towering cumulus, but are in fact a cloud known as Alto Cumulus Castellanus. They are much higher based clouds. While these clouds do not directly lead to thunderstorm development, they do signify the presence of atmospheric instability. Oftentimes, when these are viewed in the morning, they can sig signify potential for thunderstorms later in the day. In this picture, note the ragged, ill-defined tops to the clouds. These clouds, or other flat-like cumulus, almost pancake-like in appearance, will not lead to thunderstorm development. These are another example of fair weather cumulus clouds. Note the lack of vertical development and the uh, rather jagged edges, not the nice, crisp, clean, well-defined edges. These clouds actually form when there is some degree of low-level lift that gets the moisture to condense into clouds. However, due to strong atmospheric stability, they are unable to develop prolonged and or deep updrafts. As rising currents of air in the updraft continue to cool and condense into cloud droplets, condensation eventually leads to the development of rain droplets. Liquid and ice particles will become suspended at the top of the cloud. This leads to a charge separation between the top of the cloud and the ground, resulting in lightning. Eventually, the weight of the rain and ice in the top of the cloud become too heavy for the updraft to, to sustain them. They will then fall toward the ground. As they fall through the cloud, some evaporation occurs around the rain droplets. While not typically enough to evaporate the entire rain droplet, at least not in the Great Lakes region, this evaporation will cool the air around the rain drop. Cool air is more dense than warm air, so will fall to the ground in the form of a downdraft. Once the thunderstorm downdraft develops, the storm has moved into its mature phase. During the mature phase, the storm is at its strongest. This is an example of a strong thunderstorm out in the plains in its mature phase. Eventually, the rain-cooled downdraft air, which hits the ground and spreads outward from the point of impact, will cut off the updraft of the storm. Once this occurs, the thunderstorm will become completely dominated by downdrafts, and it will move into its dissipation phase. In the dissipation phase, the cloud tops collapse and the cloud edges become ill-defined. The entire life cycle of a thunderstorm from towering cue to dissipation phase takes on the order of 20 to 30 minutes. This is an example of a thunderstorm in its dissipation phase. Note how the cloud edges are much less defined. Even though the storm is in its dissipation phase, it will still be capable of producing heavy rain, gusty winds, and lightning, and still poses a turbulence and icing risk to aircraft. This image goes through the life cycle of the downburst. The downburst is the initial surge of rain-cooled air as it descends from the base of a thunderstorm. The formation stage is when it drops out of the base of the cloud. The thunderstorm then hits the ground. At the point of impact, there is a burst of strong winds. The winds then push outward at the point of impact. The lead edge of the rain-cooled air is called the gust front. In more intense thunderstorms, the gust front can push outward several miles away from the base of the thunderstorm. As the winds move away from the storm, they gradually weaken due to friction. This is the dissipation stage of the downburst. In this example, we can see the rain-cooled air emerging from the base of the storm. This is the point at which the strong winds push outward and away from the point of impact. Note the lead edge of the winds or gust front as it pushes away from the point of impact. The strongest wind shears are located along the lead edge of the gust front. In the next section, we will discuss the four main types of thunderstorms. This includes single cell, multi cell cluster, the linear multi cell, and the supercell. 
The first type is the single cell. The single cell is essentially a storm that goes through the three-stage life cycle from towering cumulus to mature to dissipation within a 20 to 30 minute time period. These storms are also often referred to as air mass thunderstorms. The multi-cell cluster are several storms occurring at the same time, all within different stages of their individual life cycle. New thunderstorms actually develop off the thunderstorm outflow from the mature thunderstorm. This gust front provides a source of lift for new thunderstorm development. You can see in the top image, cell four is in the towering Q stage. Cell three is moving into the mature phase. Cell two is in the mature phase and cell one is in the dissipation stage. Note that 10 minutes later that the cell three is now in the mature phase while cell two is now in its dissipation phase while a brand new cell five is already formed and is in the towering cumulus stage. This is what a thunderstorm cluster may look like from a distance. Note how the towering Q clouds have the crisp and well-defined edges, while the tops of the cells in the dissipation phase have collapsed with the edges much less defined. The strongest storm is going to be the mature cell. In the real world, multi-cell clusters often have a much more chaotic organizational structure. This makes their movement and where the next thunderstorm will emerge difficult, if not impossible, to predict. This would definitely be a no-fly situation in the radar example we have here. A multi-cell line is where storms form along a line, often called a squall line. The atmosphere in these instances are characterized by high atmospheric instability and a good deal of wind shear, meaning the winds increase with height. This wind shear causes the updraft to be tilted in the vertical, which then causes the downdraft to be displaced away from the updraft region. So the downdraft has difficulty cutting off the updraft. This then results in the line of storms that can be very long lived in some cases several hours as they propel themselves forward. This is how a squall line would appear on radar. One thing to note is that even though there may be breaks in the squall line, it is ill-advised to fly through them as they may fill in with new thunderstorm development rather quickly. The final type of thunderstorms are the supercell storms. These storms also form within an atmosphere of high instability and strong wind shear. In this case, the wind speeds increase with height and there is also a directional change with the winds with height. This then causes the updraft that is tilted in the vertical and rotates. Note that these storms are less common in the Great Lakes but are associated with a tremendous amount of turbulence, wind shear, and icing. In this instance, this is how the top of a supercell might be viewed, say 20 to 50 miles away. Note the large, persistent overshooting top and thick, crisp edged anvil. In this case, when you see a well-defined anvil like this and the nice crisp uh, cloud top, that is significant in that it tells you that this is a strong thunderstorm. These are features generally viewed five to 10 miles away from the thunderstorm. In the top uh, left image there, we have the flanking line, which is a line of towering cumulus clouds, which lead up to the main storm tower of the supercell and in the bottom right is the uh, how the main storm tower itself of the supercell would appear this is how these storms would appear on radar in most instances they are more easy to navigate around however beware that uh, clear air turbulence generally above 40,000 feet can be present for several miles away from the parent storm 
This is how a supercell would look from the ground. Note that the anvil is pointing to the left in this image. That is actually the direction in which the storm is moving as the winds aloft are what steer the direction of the supercell. And this concludes the presentation.